Good evening. Welcome to tonight's CPAR lecture. My name is Maria Safone. I'm an attending physician out of Good Samaritan Hospital in uh, Long Island, New York. This webinar and uh, lecture series is hosted by Operation Footprint. It is also affiliated with the American Board of Podiatric Medicine. Uh, so tonight, uh, we have a great lecturer coming up, but before I introduce him, I'm gonna go over some ground rules as usual. Stay on for the entirety of the lecture. Make sure you answer the post-lecture survey and save your certificate. Tonight, due to the nature of the lecture and the content covered, CME unfortunately could not be covered and provided. However, we do have MOC available for those ABPM members who are listening in. So with that, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Bava Shah. He is co-coordinator of this lecture series and a surgeon with Operation Footprint. Dr. Bava Shah. Hello, welcome to uh, our uh, CIFAR lecture for today. Um, our lecture today is going to be about um, how to manage some of the severe deformities that we normally would see uh, in our clinic. And um, it truly is a uh, in a strategic position because our last series comprised of um, severe flat feet uh, and uh, its management of and uh, we're now um, ending our series of Aquinas uh, lectures. Um, and uh, this lecture can actually contribute to both of those series, um, especially if you are more inclined to do conservative treatment. Well, today we have a lecturer, Dr. Doug Ritchie. Uh, he's a well-known representative of our profession. He graduated from CCPM and he truly has embedded himself within the culture of our profession. Um, he has held several professional positions, has lectured extensively, published over several decades, and continues to partake in the education of our new graduates. He holds several patents of which one is famously known as the Ritchie Brace, and which is utilized to treat some of the most severe and neglected deformities in the foot and ankle paradigm. So today, please join us uh, in welcoming Dr. Doug Ritchie who will share with us his extensive experience in treating some of the most severe foot and ankle deformities. And um, I, would, I would encourage all our participants to submit questions to truly learn what he has learned in or prior to designing the brace and how it has changed the approach in treating some of those deformities, especially if surgery is not uh, an option. Dr. Doug Ritchie, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to come back and uh, lecture to your group. Uh, we have a, a really good turnout tonight for this, which is uh, kind of reaffirming the uh, value of considering conservative care uh, before uh, undertaking some of these uh, complex surgical interventions and certainly using some of these modalities as a follow-up um, uh, intervention to facilitate recovery from surgery. So there, there's great relevance here, both pre-op and post-op to what I'm about to share with you. Uh, just a disclosure, uh, I am the owner of a company that both uh, manufactures and distributes AFO devices. Um, this lecture, as you will see, is very unbiased, uh, not focused specifically on the Ritchie brace, but uh, hopefully will open up your um, uh, perspective to how effective all AFO devices are to treat many of the pathologies we encounter. I kind of start with one of my uh, favorite cases that I uh, used an AFO brace on. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a younger man who suffered a common perineal nerve injury after a traumatic knee dislocation, and he wears a, uh, a knee brace to stabilize his knee but he's got a drop foot from the common perineal nerve injury. And just intervening with a appropriate dynamic assist brace with Tamarack dorsiflex assist hinges, we can restore almost a normal gait to this young man who's otherwise healthy and wants to resume an active lifestyle. So the message here is that these interventions can be among the most gratifying of things that we do in clinical practice, both surgical and non-surgical. Much of what I'm gonna share with you, I wrote up, uh, boy, way back in, uh, I think it was in 2007, 
uh, actually 2009, but you can still find this article in Podiatry Management, uh, where I try to talk about the biomechanics of AFOs, which in the podiatric community aren't, isn't really well known because most of what we were taught in our training was relevant to these devices, which are known as functional foot orthoses. Not to downplay, but foot orthoses do have their value and certainly have uh, a long proven track record of uh, improving pathologies that we treat. And just from a biomechanical standpoint, we've learned from a lot of research over the past 20 years that foot orthoses basically function by redirecting or altering ground reaction forces. And this seems to change joint moments uh, or uh, alter joint moments in a positive way or sometimes a negative way, proximal to where the foot plate actually contacts the foot. From studies we've done, most of the effects seem to be at the subtalar joint, but we do see proximal effects even at the patellofemoral joint. But although we've seen significant effects on moment, joint moment, we don't see a lot of change of alignment. The way foot orthoses really exert their effect is through the contour and the, uh, the, the fit of the device against the foot, either facilitating a proprioceptive response with muscular activation or with mechanical effect through simple uh, ground reaction forces, either medial, lateral, or distal to the joint axes that they affect. But these devices are effective and they do affect joint moments proximal to the plantar surface of the foot. And there's no need to sacrifice the uh, ability of a foot orthoses to, uh, to accomplish these goals when we design and fabricate ankle foot orthoses. Foot orthoses by themselves, according to many studies, only change alignment in the realm of one or two degrees, which is of minimal visual uh, significance. But the uh, change of moments or strains on structures surrounding joints is how we really achieve the clinical benefits. If we compare foot orthoses to AFOs, we understand that foot orthoses primarily affect the foot during the stance phase of gait, while AFOs have the ability to control the foot and ankle in both phases. Indirectly do foot orthoses affect the ankle, whereas AFOs, because they go above the ankle joint, can affect direct control. What I'm about to show you is the control of tibial rotation is integral to the way we control and affect many of these complex foot and ankle deformities. AFOs apply forces both above and below the rear foot complex, providing two lever arms, which is a substantial advantage over the simple effect of functional foot orthoses. So the ability to control the ankle above and below allows us, for example, to control a varus rotation of the ankle combined with dorsiflexion weakness or drop foot deformity. As we look at the way ankle foot orthoses can work, we're gonna go through four different mechanisms and try to make them clinically relevant to specific conditions that you see in your clinical setting. The first and most simple and probably the most common way most clinicians look at AFOs is to restrict motion. And that is a viable intervention goal but it also is a very limited way to look at AFOs. Other ways are gonna be discussed further as we go into this lecture. So restricting rotational moment or, or a motion at a joint uses relatively simple AFOs that apply force in three specific locations. They not only can restrict motion, but we should keep in mind that they can preserve alignment of the foot, for example, hold the ankle joint in a dorsiflex position or 90 degrees to the leg to allow toe clearance during the swing phase of gait. So these relatively simple and early AFOs were polypropylene injection molded shells that apply force on the plantar surface of the foot. They apply force on the posterior aspect of the leg and they usually require an anterior force on the tibial section. The problem is a simple orthosis like this that simply locks the ankle joint at 90 degrees pays a price in terms of the function of the patient during dynamic gait. We have to keep in mind the following changes that occur 
to the foot and leg when we lock the ankle with a plastic device. When we limit ankle joint plantar flexion by holding the foot in fixed dorsiflexion, the knee must now flex extensively to get the forefoot on the ground. Without ankle flexion, something has to bring the forefoot to the ground, and it usually is the knee. So this fixation of the foot in 90 degrees of dorsiflexion puts a flexion moment, which is often excessive at the proximal joint for the knee. We can reduce that moment or the velocity of the delivery of moment by applying a heel rocker to the shoe. This dampens or slows down the contact phase of gait with heel strike and forefoot loading, such that load at the knee is reduced. This is a good strategy when you put a patient in a, a solid AFO and they suddenly complain of knee pain. Walking boots, which many of us prescribe, already have a heel rocker applied to soften or decrease the uh, velocity of load to the knee. The secondary concern, like we've learned in surgical procedures, if we fuse the ankle or lock the ankle, we're going to place greater sagittal plane demand on joints both proximal and distal to the ankle. So when we lock the ankle in a patient, for example, with Charcot deformity, we actually increase the demand for midfoot dorsiflexion, which is not a desirable treatment effect. We're gonna go into that more later in the lecture. Finally, when we lock the ankle with a rigid AFO, we, sig we significantly affect balance. And in many of our patients that we use AFOs, balance has already been compromised. If we allow motion, for example, with a dynamic AFO, the compromise of balance is significantly mitigated. If we must lock the ankle with an AFO, consider using a cane for patients who are at risk for traumatic falls, because adding a cane enables the hand and the wrist to become a proprioceptor. Studies have shown that when patients simply standing with neuropathy and are given a cane, their, their sway and postural control is significantly improved simply by giving them a cane to improve proprioception. So that's a good preventive or uh, treatment adjunct when we put a patient in a walking boot, a crow boot, or a solid AFO. Give them a cane to help offset the negative effects of balance and proprioception. So traditional solid shell AFOs have their place in certain conditions, which we're about to show you, but we have to understand that they have minimal effects in controlling transverse plane and frontal plane rotation of the tibia over the fixed foot. Most pathologies we treat involve excessive transverse plane and frontal plane motion. And so the sagittal plane control of a solid AFO is of minimal value in many of these conditions. That's why restricting translational motion, which is multiplanar motion at the subtalar joint, the ankle joint and the mid tarsal joint becomes a more <clears throat> important clinical application of AFOs. We learned this actually more proximally in anterior cruciate ligament tears, which is also a multiplanar uh, injury resulting in a rather debilitating loss of the anterior cruciate ligament. It's both a rotational deformity of the femur in the transverse plane, as well as a valgus deformity in the frontal plane. This translation of the joint resulting in tear of the anterior cruciate ligament is addressed in both a treatment and a preventive measure with specific bracing. These are specialized braces that require four points of fixation, use, utilize Velcro straps and pads applied tightly to the skin surface in order to restrict transverse plane and frontal plane motion. These sophisticated braces you will commonly see in football players, particularly interior linemen, to prevent anterior cruciate ligament tears. Again, they require close fixation against the skin and the underlying anatomy, 
utilizing Velcro straps to cinch or tighten the brace against the skin and the, uh, the, the segment to control transverse plane motion. Much more sophisticated than the simple posterior plastic shell used in solid AFOs. We can use this same technology and principle in controlling translational deformity of the adult acquired flat foot which is clearly a multi-planar deformity in both transverse, sagittal, and frontal plane. This was discussed extensively in my previous lecture on managing the adult-acquired flat foot with AFO bracing. In short, this multi-planar deformity can con be controlled most effectively in the proximal segment, the tibiofibular unit. By controlling internal and external rotation of the tibia, we can therefore, through movement coupling, control eversion of the calcaneus as well as abduction of the forefoot on the rear foot across the talonavicular joint. We do this by controlling the talus at the talonavicular joint by controlling the tibia because the talus is firmly locked within the ankle mortise, void of any muscular attachments, and is a passive recipient of motion delivered to it from proximal from the tibia and fibular articulations. This has been discussed by several anatomists and orthopedic surgeons, this intimate relationship of the tibia and the talus, which as Pisani showed is very similar to the femur, meaning the tibia and the talus, meaning the head of the uh, femur in the acetabulum, which he calls the coxapetus. But it's this acetabulum of the foot, the coxapetus of the foot, the talocalcaneal navicular joint that is restrained by the spring ligament. And in order to control the talus migrating in this joint, you have to control the tibia, particularly after the spring ligament ruptures. So we're trying to control the talus in three planes, which is very difficult to do with its simple foot orthoses, but it's much more easy to control if we can control the tibia. If we can control tibial rotation, we can control tailor rotation. And indeed in the adult acquired flat foot, it's this internal rotation of the fibula and the tibia, driving the talus medial, reciprocally driving the forefoot into abduction that we can control with a specially designed ankle foot orthoses. Velcro straps and pads applied intimately, an ability to tighten the, the uh, uprights against the skin or the uh, segment of the lower leg. You must be able to tighten those members each and every day to maximal tightness and comfort in order to control transverse plane rotation. A mistake many orthotists make, in my opinion, is connecting the uprights with plastic, making this one solid unit. Once it's connected in solid, you cannot cinch it, you cannot tighten it, you cannot maximize the contour against the lower leg. Once it's fabricated like this, it cannot be tightened. Therefore, the patient can easily rotate the leg in the transverse plane without restriction. If, however, we allow the patient to use Velcro to tighten the uprights against the leg. We now restrict internal and external rotation in a much more significant way. So what looks like a more flimsy brace or a less controlling brace than the solid connector upright, this brace actually is better designed and is better able to control tibial rotation because of its ability to be customized and cinched to the leg. Indeed, a study we did with the Ritchie brace at uh, um, University of Massachusetts showed that it was the transverse plane rotation of the tibia that was the most effective part of the kinematic changes after we braced the patient. It wasn't rear foot eversion. It wasn't sagittal plane. It was the transverse plane. We can even further augment that with more straps and pads under the talonavicular joint to customize the fit and the control across the midfoot joints. We'll talk about that a little further into the lecture. 
Indeed, the triplane control of a properly designed ankle foot orthosis can control both frontal plane, transverse plane, and sagittal plane motion. And as I showed in my previous lecture, the research on these types of braces shows that up to 50% of patients with stage two adult acquired flat foot and spring ligament rupture can avoid surgery with functional bracing and eventually discontinue bracing and be managed with just simple custom foot orthoses. These are just some uh, cases showing the effectiveness of a brace. This is a patient with a stage two adult acquired flat foot, flexible, reducible, unilateral on his left side, classic heel eversion, forefoot abduction, okay. unilateral on the left side. But what's interesting is he's able to wear his AFO brace in a sandal, a sport sandal, because the brace really does everything here. The sandal is required to control the forefoot with the straps of the sandal, but because the brace is uh, applied to the leg and attached to the leg, it doesn't slide anywhere. As a foot orthotic would slide around in the sandal, the brace doesn't go anywhere because it's attached to the leg. Patients can wear AFO braces in work boots if they can be cinched and tightened to the leg and not interfere with the fit of the boot. The upper of the boot is now no longer effective or needed because the brace is doing all the work, but many of our patients are in, in industrial settings where they're required to wear industrial boots, and that is not or does not preclude the use of a custom AFO brace. This is a demonstration of the profound transverse plane correction that can be achieved with a specially designed AFO brace that also incorporates a lifting strap under the talonavicular joint for that intimate fit and contour to the skin, the underlying bony segments crossing multiple joints. This is a stage four adult acquired flat foot characterized by rupture of the deep deltoid ligament, causing significant eversion deformity, not only of the subtalar joint, but the talocural joint. This can be controlled with functional bracing if the patient is not a candidate for surgery. This particular patient was an elderly patient with uh, cardiac problems. He had not been cleared for major reconstructive surgery by his primary care and cardiologist. So we braced him. And indeed, a deformity like that can actually be effectively braced. This is before bracing. Notice the severe valgus rotation of both the ankle, characterized by dropping of the medial malleolus to the ground. We used a, a fixed position Ritchie brace with a, a lifting strap positioned under the talonavicular joint. We are able to achieve some correction of alignment, even though this is a rigid stage four non-reducible deformity. So we were not gonna see the visual improvement of alignment with a more reducible deformity, but more importantly, the patient functions relatively pain-free and we've greatly improved the quality of his life. Set, thirdly, we can restore motion at a joint that has otherwise lost motion. How do you lose motion at a joint? Primarily, it's due to loss of muscle function. For example, in the drop foot deformity, AFO bracing has traditionally been used for many decades to control uh, plantar flexion deformity that occurs from loss of dorsiflexion muscle activity either from direct muscle injury or from nerve injury, both peripheral nerves or more centrally from a stroke. Using AFO bracing for drop foot conditions, for paralytic conditions, tendon rupture is a new horizon for podiatric surgeons that has really been gaining attention just over the last 10 years. Yet we still see these patients for other reasons in our clinical setting. Patients with a stroke de develop neurotrophic ulcerations. Charcot-Marie Tooth has multiple problems that will present to podiatric surgeons. And of course, we're seeing more and more patients with multiple sclerosis, 
and we will uh, occasionally see patients come in with foot problems resulting from proximal or, or central nervous system brain injuries with spasticity and result in skin injuries. Ideally, we want to brace a drop foot to provide efficient dorsiflexion during the swing phase of gait. But we still don't want to re restrict all ankle motion. We want to allow plantar flexion, particularly during the heel rise or terminal stance phase of gait. We can't forget that these braces must fit comfortably in all types of footwear or the patients aren't going to wear them. And for that reason, the braces must be cosmetically acceptable. It's still baffling why many uh, cl uh, bracing clinicians still defer to the old fashioned solid AFO to treat drop foot, which doesn't satisfy any of those conditions that I just presented. If we, we have found that we can use a more lower profile brace that does fit comfortably into shoes, is not as noticeable, and yet it still controls the drop foot deformity during swing phase and allows some plantar flexion during the mid stance and uh, terminal stance. Ideally, the brace should have dynamic hinges that allow give a spring-like effect or a recoil of the uh, foot during swing phase to plantar to dorsiflex, yet allow free unrestricted plantar flexion and dorsiflexion during the stance phase of gait. These Tamarack hinges, which have been popular in the ONP community for over 30 years, allow the patient to, to load the brace in uh, dorsiflexion, and when they stand upright, the brace is now loaded with tension developed in the spring-like hinges, so when they lift their foot off the ground, it's maintained into dorsiflexion. So this dynamic assist action of these Tamarack hinges can be extremely effective in certain forms of drop foot deformity. The brace itself can be fashioned in a way to control frontal plane deformities that often accompany passive drop foot conditions. The first consideration though, when we evaluate patients with drop foot is we have to watch them walk. <clears throat> and when we watch them walk, we look at the proximal joints, and one consideration is stability of the knee. If the knee is stable, we can consider some of these newer dynamic hinged AFOs. But if the state the knee is unstable, we often have to use more restrictive AFOs to control the tibia. What is an unstable knee? Obviously, it's a concern when treating drop foot, and it's basically a condition that results from either excessive or abnormal sagittal plane motion of the tibia over the foot. It will be seen, for example, with excessive flexion of the knee when there are weak quadriceps, tight hamstrings, or weak soleus muscles. We will see the opposite in some patients. An unstable knee can move into excessive extension or recurvatum, and we must take that into consideration with the design or prescription of the AFO. We also have to take into account significant varus or valgus deformity of the knee, whether we're doing foot orthotic therapy or custom AFO therapy. Bottom line is you must watch them walk. You must evaluate the patient's static stance and uh, off weight bearing. And you must evaluate the proximal joints. Let's look at the case of a weakness of the posterior musculature. This comes into play during the mid-stance phase of gait, which is the longest part of the gait cycle. During mid-stance, the foot is supporting the entire body over the ground. The other foot is in swing phase, and the entire body is rotating over the fixed foot in the condition known as the inverted pendulum. As the tibia moves forward, it initiates what we call the second rocker. The tibia is rocking over the talus, and the fixed foot. The soleus is responsible for restraining the anterior uh, migration of the tibia over the, the fixed foot. As tibial advancement slows dur due to activity of the soleus, the femur catches up as it moves over the tibia, and this allows the knee to move into extension. Message here is that you must have an adequate, strong, functioning soleus 
to restrain tibial advancement and facilitate extension of the knee during the mid stance phase of gait. Allowing the knee to go into uh, extension, coupled with dorsiflexion of the ankle, places strain and load and storage of uh, elastic energy in the Achilles for the propulsive phase of terminal stance. If the patient has weakness of the soleus, the tibia abnormally translates anteriorly, the ankle excessively dorsiflexes, and the knee drops. The knee moves into excessive, extensive flexion. We will see this in the child with muscular dystrophy, weakness of the posterior calf musculature, causing a crouching gait, excessive knee flexion, excessive ankle joint dorsiflexion, and oftentimes due to proximal hip muscle weakness, excessive genu valgum. The solution for a weak posterior musculature is a carbon fiber AFO with an anterior shell to restrict and decelerate anterior migration of the tibia over the fixed foot. Consideration to be made for adding heel wedges to help facilitate plantar flexion of the ankle when there is no effective plantar flexion from the weakness of the calf musculature. The contrary is the knee that moves into rec or bottom from either gastrocnemius tightness, contracture, in the case of polio due to weakness of the um, uh, posterior uh, uh, musculature of the hamstring. And in this case, instead of a posterior anterior shell, we apply a posterior shell of an AFO to push the tibia forward and move the knee out of rec or bottom. So in this case, a solid AFO is desirable to control that flexion deformity or rec or bottom of the knee. So th this is really the take home message here is you've got to look at the knee and consider the design of the AFO to control tibial rotation and knee stability. This is a patient who actually had suffered from polio as a child. He's now 88 years old, but he demonstrates the classic deformity that we see in polio, starting with excessive rec or bottom of the knee. We see equinus contracture at the ankle, varus deformity of the ankle, and drop foot. Very complicated, multi-level deformity that usually requires very sophisticated AFOs. His, in this case, we want to be able to move the tibia forward with a more solid AFO to prevent the rec bottom, and then bring into play other additive features to move the ankle out of varus. And I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. But the bottom line is, this patient who has a fixed equinus deformity you have to take that into account in the design and prescription of the AFO because a brace can only move an ankle within the range of motion that's available by the patient. If they have a fixed equinus, leaving the ankle plantar flexed at 10 degrees, that's how you have to design the brace. The brace can't overcome that. If they have adequate ankle joint dorsiflexion, great. You can use a full flexion hinge device. But if they have fixed equinus, you have to design the brace accordingly. This is a brace that we modified from the Ritchie brace called the dynamic assist brace. It has the tamarack hinges to allow free ankle plantar flexion during the contact phase of gait, but the dynamic hinges allow a dorsiflex assist during swing phase. However, it requires a stable knee. If you have a free motion ankle and the knee is unstable, the knee will remain unstable. Also, these hinges cannot overcome significant spasticity or contracture of the posterior calf musculature that create equinus deformity. So the brace has a specific criteria, but it happens to work very well on patients with hemiplegia, passive drop foot who don't have equinus. In order to determine that, you must perform a detailed range of motion and muscle strength assessment. Unstable knee, you tend to have to go to a solid or, or more restrictive AFO. If there's spasticity 
and contracture, a, a dynamic hinged device will not restrict that. A different type of device must be done. So when you have a patient like this whose maximal dorsiflexion is minus 10 degrees, the brace must be designed to fit that deformity accordingly. But the patients who have had a stroke, who have mild drop foot, mild to moderate drop foot without spasticity or contracture, are ideal patients to be fitted for a hinged AFO with the Tamarack hinges. Here's a patient with mild drop foot. Patient is just barely heel striking, but otherwise looks fairly stable in gait. They're a good candidate for the dynamic assist Ritchie brace, which facilitates a heel strike and restores a more normal uh, bilateral symmetrical gait pattern. This is an interesting patient who uh, is in her mid-20s and she has already suffered a stroke. And the reason she suffered a stroke is because she has lupus. There's a, a subcategory of lupus that creates hypercoagulability. And this poor girl in her mid-20s went to bed one night and woke up in the morning with hemiplegia affecting her left side, her hand, arm, and left foot because she had a stroke, a CVA. Here's how she walks. Fortunately, it's a relatively mild hemiplegia, but it's definitely a drop foot. And because she's young, she doesn't want to wear a bulky, solid AFO. She wants to be able to wear her Vans tennis shoes and not draw attention to herself. So we fitted her for the low profile dynamic assist brace, and it allows her to heel strike and walk with a much more stable gait pattern. And when she rolls her pants down over the brace, it's not even noticeable. This is a patient who suffered a common perineal nerve injury, otherwise healthy and active. He has a passive drop foot without spasticity, without contracture, strong posterior calf muscle, a very active guy who wants to be able to play tennis, although he has a drop foot. We've learned that we can use the dynamic assist brace in athletic patients because it restores almost normal motion to the ankle joint and allowed this patient to return to tennis activities with relatively little restriction, despite the fact that he has a significant common perineal nerve injury. Okay. And then this patient I showed you earlier, very similar, common perineal nerve injury, no spasticity, no contracture, no equinus, but a flaccid drop foot with varus instability across the subtalar joint complex. He's fitted for a dynamic assist Ritchie brace with valgus wedging, a valgus rear foot post, a valgus forefoot extended post to control the varus instability. So basically, we've gone through hemiplegia secondary to stroke, but a lot of us see patients with Charcot-Marie tooth in various stages. And we have found that we can very effectively help intervene with these patients who have very profound drop foot deformity, but are otherwise healthy. This is a registered nurse who worked at my hospital who had a passive drop foot and was wearing solid AFOs to control the drop foot and by the way as they all do significant cavus deformity and varus and varus instability of the hind foot complex due to the muscle imbalance that sets up from charcot marie tooth she works on the uh, in the clinic and walks several miles a day and it was very gratifying to intervene with the dynamic assist and to help control this foot pretty well in the uh, uh, frontal plane and significantly in the sagittal plane because she's heel striking now and not forefoot striking. And she loves wearing these braces in her athletic shoes, which she can wear in her duties as a registered nurse. Okay, I'm gonna skip through this. This is a little more, Esoteric, and we're going to go to cerebral palsy, 
this is probably one of the more challenging conditions which we can evaluate because of the multi-levels of spasticity and contracture along with frontal plane deformity. And uh, this, uh, they almost always have equinus coupled with hamstring contracture. And in many cases, we, we would get patients like this who have already undergone multiple surgical procedures to try to get the foot flat on the ground as this uh, fellow has. His primary complaint is he's still dragging his foot and the varus instability of the foot. So it's really the frontal plane instability that we're trying to deal with here. As I pointed out early, when he has spasticity and contracture, we can't use those tamarack hinges because he's going to overpower them with his spasticity and contracture. So in this position, in this case, we used a fixed position Ritchie brace. <clears throat> and our goal is to try to improve ground clearance as well as control that frontal plane deformity, which I think you can see we did a pretty good job of here of uh, bringing his rear foot into a more perpendicular alignment at mid stance due to uh, some enhancements we provided to the brace, which I'm going to show you in a few minutes. So we went from this to this with a low profile Ritchie brace holding the ankle in a 90 degree fixed position and some intrinsic changes to the foot plate to control the varus instability. Finally, this is an interesting patient who literally walked across the northern uh, border of Spain on uh, what is known as the Camino Santiago or the Pilgrim Walk. Uh, many of you are familiar with this. Uh, this is a 500 kilometer walk. It takes about 45 days to complete where you're averaging at least 30 kilometers a day. And this fellow was able to accomplish it in 30 days wearing a dynamic assist brace to control a drop foot condition. There he is with his brace on. And this is the brace after he completed the Camino walk with his worn out shoe. His condition was brought on by a mountain bike accident where he developed a laceration that went on to infection. He had to have multiple debridements of the anterior leg musculature and left him with a mild drop foot. You can see him dragging that left foot due to muscle weaknesses. This is not a neurologic injury. It's a uh, direct mechanical defect in the anterior musculature leading to drop foot. But he's otherwise very athletic and he wants to walk across the uh, country of Spain. So we put him in the dynamic assist brace. He's able to heel strike. He has good stability in the frontal and transverse plane. And with the free motion of this brace, he has a relatively normal gait pattern and was able to walk about 30 kilometers a day and complete the Camino walk. We've been able to extend this type of treatment with common perineal nerve injuries uh, in several cases, uh, rather extraordinary cases of elite athletes who suffer drop foot secondary to common perineal nerve injury. This is a picture of a, a fellow named Jalon Smith in the Orange Bowl about six years ago. He was the uh, starting middle linebacker for University of Notre Dame playing Ohio State in the Orange, in the, uh, or, uh, I'm sorry, in the Fiesta Bowl in uh, Tempe, Arizona. And he suffered a severe non-contact knee injury that resulted in a tear of the anterior cruciate ligament, posterior cruciate, medial collateral, and unfortunately, a significant uh, traction injury to the common perineal nerve. He recovered with surgery to the ruptured ligaments, but the perineal nerve did not recover. And this otherwise gifted athlete who won the Butkus Award that year as the nation's number one linebacker now has a very healthy body, but a common perineal nerve injury leading to drop foot. He was projected to be a second pick in the first round of the NFL draft, and he was ultimately picked in the fourth or fifth round by the Dallas Cowboys, hoping that his common perineal nerve injury would recover. He wore a dynamic assist Ritchie brace for one year, and during that time, he was able to significantly strengthen various muscles of his lower extremities to perform at an extremely high level with his brace on. The starting linebacker for the 
Cowboys was hurt in the preseason and Jalon Smith was a, was a, a starter from the first game onward wearing a Richie brace here. It's all taped up on his left foot and he competed all season with a drop foot, but very effectively controlled with the dynamic assist brace. His drop foot condition resolved such that he was able to move out of the Richie brace by the second season, which he completed and made the Pro Bowl and signed an extensive extended contract with the Dallas Cowboys. It's a great story that just has uh, so many good parts to it, not, not the least of which is that he recovered and didn't have to wear his brace after the first year. We've been able to put the brace on several athletes with passive drop foot simply uh, because the brace is mobile and allows them to perform at a high level, uh, despite in this case, um, <clears throat> this patient uh, had a herniated disc in his low back resulting in a temporary hemiplegia of his lower leg. We can use AFO bracings finally to control axial forces across a joint. Many of you are aware of the use of these older fashioned patellar uh, tendon bearing orthoses to offload fractures across the ankle foot and even to offload Charcot deformity. These were uh, popular back in the 70s and 80s and have been replaced with more uh, well-designed and more patient tolerant braces. But offloading braces are very popular in the knee, for example, to decompress or redirect axial load across an arthritic joint. This is an offloading brace, for example, to uh, create a varus moment across the knee joint in the case of either degenerative arthritis or a torn meniscus. So the, the concept of offloading bracing using the same principles of tight applied Velcro straps and pads can now specifically offload damage parts of a specific joint, whether it's a meniscus or cartilage. So we can use this principle in the ankle joint. And we have found that with specific bracing strategies, we can take an ankle or subtalar joint and look at the area of the joint that is getting most compression and then use strategies to offload or decompress the joint, whether it's in the sagittal plane, the frontal plane, or the transverse plane. So we have to identify where the joint is damaged, look at the deformity both clinically and radiographically, and then come up with a strategy whether to offload it both in the frontal plane or the sagittal plane with the, the specific brace prescription. For example, in the case of adult acquired flat foot with both spring ligament and deltoid ligament rupture, we know that there's significant compression occurring across the lateral subtalar joint, sinus tarsi, and even the ankle joint. So in this case, we're trying to decompress the lateral side of the rear foot complex, and we're trying to invert the uh, calcaneus as much as possible to decompress the joint. We can also apply force more proximal to try to abduct the talus back over the calcaneus. <clears throat> so we will use this concept of straps, pads, and we will try to invert the ankle and the midfoot joints with the straps and pads to decompress. So in this case, we have a deep deltoid ligament rupture, stage four adult acquired flat foot that has allowed significant eversion of the talus within the ankle joint mortis. The pain is emanating from compression here at the lateral dome of the talus and sinus tarsi, and also the body of the calcaneus actually abutting against the fibular malleolus. So what we wanna do is rotate this segment medially and bring it back underneath the foot as we did with this patient with stage four adult acquired flat foot. So we use straps and pads and we invert the entire foot and ankle complex against the fixed tibia and we can decompress the joint. If we can decompress the joint, we can relieve pain. The basic message here is when we have lateral impingement, as I showed you with the adult acquired flat foot, we use medial wedging. If we have medial ankle joint impingement, we use lateral wedging. 
And I will illustrate that here. Lateral impingement, this patient's facing a uh, um, <clears throat> total ankle joint replacement, but perhaps they're not ready for surgery. Perhaps they have other health concerns and they can't undergo surgery. We can make life a lot more comfortable for them by rotating the foot and ankle medially with an AFO brace. Same as here, lateral impingement, we want to bring the ankle and foot back medially. To start with, we apply a medial scive to the foot plate. A medial scive under the foot plate provides a varus wedge shape under the calcaneus to then induce inversion moment across the subtalar joint. Inversion moment, medial directed moment will help invert the subtalar joint and bring the calcaneus medially. We can then add what we call the medial arch suspender. This is a strap that actually secures under the foot, comes under the talonavicular joint, across the front of the ankle joint, and can be customized and cinched according to patient tolerance to invert the midfoot joints. So as we lift and pull, we invert and elevate the talonavicular joint off the ground. This imparts a inversion moment more proximal to the ankle joint and helps decompress the ankle joint. Finally, we can add wedging to the foot plate itself of the AFO. In the case of a lateral impingement, we wanna add a varus or medial wedge effect to the foot plate. So we do all three. We do a medial scythe, we do a medial arch suspender, and we do a medial or varus wedge. Now we may get cases of an ankle joint where there's medial impingement. If there's medial impingement, we do just the opposite. We do a lateral scive. And here's a case of a medial impingement, by the way. In this case, we wanna evert the ankle joint complex out of the varus deformity. We use a lateral scive and a lateral arch suspender strap and a lateral forefoot sulcus wedge. Here's a patient with DJD of the ankle, medial ankle joint impingement and varus deformity. He's putting off having an ankle fusion done and he wants to still play golf. And so what we did is we made him a functional brace with efforts, just as I described, to move the ankle out of varus. Lateral arch suspender, lateral heel scythe, lateral forefoot wedge and we decompress the medial ankle. He's still walking in varus because it's a fixed deformity, but we've moved him maybe two or three millimeters, just enough decompression to relieve his pain. That's all we're trying to do is relieve pain here. We're not gonna cosmetically correct an ankylosed ankle, but we can decompress it to the point we relieve symptoms. And this fellow was able to go back now and play golf twice a week, with minimal to no pain. He even sent me a postcard after he hiked up Camelback Mountain in Phoenix, Arizona with his son on the day of his son's graduation from Arizona State University. That fellow right here with that severe degenerated ankle was able to climb that mountain because simple functional bracing was able to decompress the joint just enough to give him pain relief. Finally, we're beginning to use carbon fiber AFO devices very effectively to treat many of the conditions I just showed you. And I wanna just bring out a couple indications for using carbon fiber AFOs. The carbon fiber AFOs are interesting because they store energy during the ankle rocker phase of gait and give some energy return and recoil for push off when the patient has muscular weakness. And I. Uh, I can just tell you there's a lot of really good research on this showing the elasticity and recoil of carbon fiber AFOs as opposed to solid plastic AFOs, which have very little energy storage. So the spring-like effect of these carbon fiber braces are quite exciting, particularly when we're trying to rehabilitate or treat patients with uh, tendon injuries or muscular injuries. We know that these solid uh, AFOs with carbon fiber 
are able to significantly reduce muscle activity of the calf musculature and loading of the Achilles tendon. And it brings to light that we can use these devices in the treatment of Achilles tendon pathology and even in the treatment of the acute Achilles tendon rupture. As most of you know, there's a growing body of evidence supporting treatment of Achilles tendon ruptures in a conservative way without surgery. And in fact, in Europe, most Achilles tendon ruptures are treated conservatively and non-operatively. What's interesting is if we look at the non-operative intervention, the protocols are all over the board. There's no wide agreement on exactly how we rehabilitate these patients when we elect to not do surgery for an Achilles tendon rupture. <clears throat> one, one strategy that we always used, not just for the rupture, but perhaps for the post-operative management of the Achilles tendon uh, pathology was to place the ankle into equinus and keep it there, either in a walking boot or a cast. And now we've learned that that's probably the worst thing we can do for a damaged Achilles or an Achilles uh, that has undergone surgical repair. We've now learned that immediate weight bearing is not only safe, but it actually facilitates collagen repair in a way much better than just simply non-weight bearing or fixing the ankle in equinus. We've learned that specialized boots that allow a graduated motion within the boot are much better than placing the patient in a fixed Aquinas cast and expecting the Achilles to heal and the calf to develop full muscular strength. But using a simple walking boot with a heel lift inside may not be the best way to do this. There's a lot of research that's been done now on the activity of the Achilles inside of uh, certain types of orthoses, whether it's walking boots or AFO devices, placing strain gauges within the Achilles or markers and looking for tendon gap and separation of the Achilles during ambulation. What's interesting is when the patients <clears throat> are placed into fixed Aquinas and walk in a cast or a cam boot, they actually increase a tension, increase muscle activity, and actually distract the repair to a greater degree than if the foot is only in mild Aquinas or even in a neutral position. Placing a patient in a fixed Aquinas cast or walking boot actually places more strain on the Achilles, especially when they bear weight, than if they're in a neutral position. What's better is to put them in a neutral 90 degree walking boot with graduated heel wedges that support the foot from the heel all the way out to the forefoot. But Rebecca Kearney in the UK has done a couple of uh, published studies showing that actually carbon fiber AFO braces such as these allow reduction of tension in the Achilles to a greater degree than a fixed position walking boot and actually facilitate a normal gait pattern with best, better muscle recruitment during the rehabilitation process. She and her research team have gone to great lengths to show that a carbon fiber AFO will lead to accelerated return to function and avoid the effects of disuse atrophy of the calf musculature than a fixed a walking boot. And so we're uh, seeing that if we combine carbon fiber AFO bracing with graduated heel wedges as the patient's recovering from either Achilles tendon surgery or the actual rupture of the Achilles, that we can rehabilitate these patients and get them out of a brace within eight weeks with a restoration of function and muscle strength better than the old fashioned way of putting them in a fixed Aquinas cast. So that's an area that I think is worthy of looking at um, as we evaluate the use of these newer, more high-tech carbon fiber AFO braces for a number of conditions. <clears throat> Finally, we've used these carbon fiber braces and are starting to use them more for the uh, forefoot amputation <clears throat> or the transmet patient. We have to recognize that when patients undergo a forefoot amputation, the studies show that 40% of them go on to a more proximal amputation within five years. They don't function well. 
they don't do well. And it's not because of vascular problems, it's because of mechanical problems that develop from the transmed amputation. Simply putting the patient in a toe filler in a standard shoe does not mitigate the mechanical compromise that occurs in a patient who's had a forefoot amputation. We've learned that if we combine the toe filler or orthosis with a carbon fiber AFO, we can restore the normal push-off phase of gait and reduce the significant shearing forces that occur of the residual foot inside the shoe after a transmed amputation. Studies have shown that using a carbon fiber AFO will provide forefoot and ankle dorsiflexion or restore it. We find that the plantar flexion lever arm is restored from the triceps and it restores the third rocker for an extended push-off phase of gait. The elastic recoil of the carbon fiber helps with energy storage and energy return. And we should really consider using this type of brace strategy in the patient with Charcot or other, other midfoot deformities because of those same mechanical principles. We have found that carbon fiber AFO bracing can be an effective management after a Lisfranc sprain or repair of the Lisfranc fracture dislocation because the carbon fiber brace can directly offload the midfoot joints and restore a propulsive phase of gait without engaging contracture of the calf musculature and load of the midfoot joints. So I think it's a fruitful area of further research that is worthy of looking at. So <clears throat> consider carbon fiber AFO bracing, perhaps in the conservative treatment or at least in the post-operative management of Lisfranc's injuries, midfoot sprains, and Achilles tendon uh, injuries. So I'm gonna leave it with that. And uh, I'm going to open it up to questions. Uh, after running a little bit over, I apologize, but hopefully uh, we've raised your level of consciousness to the point that you may have a few questions. So I'm I'm open to that. Well, thank you, Dr. Ritchie. I mean, this was wonderful lecture. Uh, you know, so much information uh, to take in and. Um, uh, the conditions that you reviewed with us uh, are definitely in indicative of things we see in our uh, practice. Um, I guess one of the first questions I have myself um, is, you've shown us some remarkable uh, deformities. Obviously, a lot of them are, uh, most of them were uh, flexible and some rigid, depending on impingement uh, in, different, in different places in the foot and the ankle. Um, for someone like someone that's a young surgeon that is taught more to do surgery and, and really uh, address the deformity surgically. Um, and you being a surgeon, have you, in your experience, after utilizing the AFO, depending on the deformity, have you had to go back and revise one planar deformity to, and, and to better fit the AFO? Uh, and or do you inadvertently use the AFO or different depending on the design to fix the deformity without having to go in surgically to repair it so the AFO can be better? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, <clears throat> well, I'll start with the most simple. I, I oftentimes would use AFOs to treat either perineal tendinopathy, tibialis anterior tendinopathy, um, where there wasn't really an acquired deformity. And if I failed and had to do a surgical repair, I would use that same brace on that patient after the surgery because there hasn't really been a change of alignment. There's certainly been a change of function, but happily they could use that same brace without modification in their rehabilitation process. Instead of putting them in a walking boot for 16 weeks, I put them back in their custom AFO brace at you know four weeks post-op. In a case of a posterior tibial tendon pathology, adult acquired flat foot, and there's realignment of the foot with osteotomy, I don't think it's wise to try to put them in that same brace uh, because of um, multiple reasons, but it's just not going to fit and it may be deleterious. So <clears throat> I, I wouldn't use, if, if there's been osteotomies and change of alignment, generally that brace is not going to be any more useful. And you have to consider either recasting them for a new brace or in some cases, they're not going to get coverage with insurance anyway, and you're going to use a more traditional 
non-custom re, uh, restrictive devices. So um, I think I think when you're evaluating these patients, I, I think the bottom line is for the younger surgeons, a lot of the stuff I showed here that you're going to look at, watching them walk, looking at the proximal joints, look at the radiographs for where the impingement is, that's just as important for the pre-surgical workup as it is for the, the strategy for developing a conservative intervention. You know, you've got to go through those steps either way. And to do it and implement a good conservative treatment before surgery, to me, is a much more prudent strategy. Dr. Bernard, any thoughts? Uh, yes, I wanted to address, uh, oh, there's, I have so many questions or so many comments, but let's let's talk about the hyperpronatory foot, PT tendon dysfunction and so forth, and the propensity of, of, uh, of young practitioners to want to go in and fuse the medial column or some uh, and it, in lieu of multiple osteotomies and or brace therapy. And one of the things that Doug was talking about relates to the moment of force uh, that uh, is brought to bear by internal rotation of the leg. And one of the problems uh, when, when people focus on restoration of, of an arch looking at a static image and better alignment ignores the fact that when you fuse the medial longitudinal arch, let's just talk about the, the, the pes planus condition, you, you eliminate the ability of an AFO to then create a moment of torque to externally rotate the tibia uh, and take advantage of the swing phase limb if they're propulsive. So one of the problems with uh, with fusions of joints is it makes for a better cosmetic result, but it does a functional result. And one of the things that, that Doug was talking, was showing more than talking, uh, was the dramatic change that you can affect on a foot by, uh, even with uh, joints that are not optimal uh, in terms of their articular uh, qualities, uh, to still allow high function uh, by getting the alignment uh, better to the point that you that you allow derotation of the tibia uh, along with its normal uh, rotation over the planted foot, the first rocker, if you will. Uh, and so uh, there's a lesson here to be learned about about don't don't jump to uh, arthrodesis too too quickly. And I think uh, Doug has pretty much shown that. Um, I have other comments too, but uh, but uh, they're on a different foot type. I'll wait till other questions come in. Let's suppose uh, the knee is relatively stable and you see a progressive deformity occurring functionally. Um, and you do not see the anterior or posterior migration of the tibia as much, where you're on the fence of whether you should consider AFO versus an orthotic, you know? So um, some, some studies have uh, determined and, and demonstrated that by having a good functional orthotic does a lot in the foot in those circumstances, especially in controlling the hind foot. Uh, and then how that, which you alluded to, controls the, the talus, which controls the tibia, and then it goes on forth, right? Um, right. How many, when you, when you approach in assessing these patients, Obviously, you showed us a lot of the severe conditions. So for that, there's a lot of there's an extensive uh, um, evaluation clinically to be performed, uh, you know, before determining what brace or some kind of concerted treatment to render. However, how many in what instances do you feel, especially most of the questions are relating to the stage two flat foot, you know, uh, where people are uncomfortable the most because it's going towards surgery, but they want to kind of control as much as they can to either prevent it or maybe the patient's not a good candidate. What are your thoughts in uh, app applying a custom or a functional orthotic versus an AFO brace to treat something like that? Yeah, that, that's a common question. And I, I think uh, basically the short answer is why not try the foot orthotic first? I mean, many times we're amazed at the efficacy of these devices uh, to affect proximal joints. You know, I showed you a couple of those impingements of the sinus tarsi and the ankle where the strategy started with the foot orthotic, the medial scive, the lateral scive. 
uh, four foot posting or wedging. Um, why not try that? Sometimes you're amazed that it's very effective and you don't need to go to the AFO. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some of our strategies are driven by reimbursement or insurance and it really shouldn't be. But uh, if, in, the, in the ideal world, you would many times start with a foot orthotic and if it didn't work, then you go to the AFO device. Because I, I, I continue to be amazed at the efficacy of foot orthotics for things that I would have thought, no way it's going to work. I'm going to go right to the AFO. Dr. Bernard, your thoughts? Well, that's the way I practice. In, in the years that I was, uh, that I was treating uh, the adult population, uh, which was about 20 years, uh, that was the direction I went. Uh, in, in a given case. I mean, there are certain cases where you're going to get on AFO automatically for a variety of reasons. But in the, it, in the subpopulation that you specified, Bavish, uh, I would normally go with a foot orthotic first, a uh, custom foot orthotic typically. And then uh, if, if that did not do the trick, uh, move to the neck, to, the, to controlling the tibia by crossing the ankle joint. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a question from uh, uh, a uh, participant. Um, the question is, what is your recommendation for a diabetic patient with an acute charcoal of the talus with an open heel ulceration? Um, they further stated that the patient is minimally weight-bearing um, but puts pressure on her affected side for transfers. This is uh, something very common, and it's something that leads to uh, frequently to a below the knee amputation if the heel ulceration is not, uh, you know, really uh, uh, treated well. Um, there's not many options left but besides doing partial calconectomies and trying to close the ulcer versus doing a BKA. So um, how are your experiences using an AFO with something like this? And, and what kind of uh, accommodations have you made to accommodate the heel ulcer, manage the charcoal and still do wound care? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those are all great questions. You know, it, it's funny, I, I, in my experience and in interacting with practitioners over the past 20 years, I, I do see a reluctance generally of using AFOs to treat Charcot. And if and when they do, they tend to use gauntlet style braces, you know, Arizona style braces, which really kind of just fix the ankle at 90, but aren't necessarily addressing the specific levels of the deformity or the loading. So um, <clears throat> I think, uh, although I would love to see some studies done, I'm convinced a carbon fiber AFO will offload uh, the heel uh, during, during dynamic gait um, because I think it takes over and provides plantar flexion power to the foot. Uh, I don't have the evidence to prove that, but I think it's true. But I think you can still design an AFO uh, to facilitate plantar flexion and get them off their heel, which is what you're trying to do. Uh, the tricky part is, you know, making these AFO braces fit and uh, uh, conform. You've got a neuropathic uh, patient. Uh, you don't want to create more ulcerations with the intervention. Um, uh, I think just simply using shoe therapy is doomed to failure. As, as I showed you with the, the list, Frank, or the, uh, the, the forefoot amputation. So I, I do think AFOs uh, uh, can be used to um, improve plantar flexion across the ankle or provide a substitute. And I would prefer a carbon fiber with a customized uh, foot overlay, a customized total contact foot orthoses made of laminated materials like uh, PPT and, uh, and uh, plastizote inside of a properly fitted shoe, I think that's a much safer combination than using a solid gauntlet or a solid shell plastic AFO. You think uh, doing a gastroid recession plays a role in this, uh, in, in, in doing this? Well, of course, because now, now you're weakening, uh, you know, their ability to plantar flex and you're increasing loading of the calcaneus. Yeah. I think Mark had a comment. Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Bernard? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I had a question first for you, Bavish. Were you, were you describing a patient that had a heel ulceration or a forefoot ulceration? Heel. Heel ulceration, correct? With so, the charcoal uh, deformity. So the charcoal deformity is, I'm assuming, in the, in the midfoot with the heel ulceration. Uh, I, well, that's why I needed clarity on that, because if it's posterior heel, 
then I was wondering where the use of a, of a rocker bottom would be. But if it's midfoot, anterior heel, midfoot, then I already have my answer. So okay. I'll just hold off on that. Um, here's a, here's uh, an interesting, here's an interesting question. Um, patient underwent a uh, tibio talo calcaneal fusion, ended up in a rocker bottom afterwards. Um, how would you accommodate the bracing? to help uh, the patient uh, ambulate and propulse with uh, with that. Now, because of you, the ankle's locked and now you're in wreck or bottom. Yeah. Well, they're in wreck or bottom because they fused it in a plantar flex position. You know, they created an Aquinas. So it's fixed. So it, it, we get these questions from practitioners all the time with various, uh, when it's a fixed Aquinas, it is what it is. So uh, we make the brace around, we cast that patient, we cast them in their maximally dorsiflex position, which will capture, in this case, an Aquinas deformity. And then we put a heel lift under that brace to bring the tibia to perpendicular. Because when we set that brace on the ground without a heel lift, it goes automatically into wreck or bottom, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's really kind of a no-brainer. It's not that difficult. We, we literally prop up the heel in the brace to push the tibia forward, and then we have to obviously put lifts on the contralateral side so we don't create a leg-leg discrepancy. Would you, um, would you consider doing a, uh, uh, some kind of a, a shoe uh, modification to help propulse uh, because of the fixed equinus position? No. I, I, I don't think I don't think a shoe modification would help that. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Bernard. All right. Uh, you you inadvertently have segued into something which is functional leg length discrepancy, and I wanted to make a comment about this with respect to the common perineal palsy patients that you had. There was one in particular. Uh, it was a pretty muscular guy. He had rather rather muscular calves that we looked at, but the point of which was. He had a uh, he had a, he was he had a very propulsive otherwise a very propulsive gait type, and in order for him to gain clearance, he was on the on the affected side. He had a lot of quadriceps compensation, so that he could get clearance. But he wasn't doing it entirely with his quads because he was also elevating his hip as well. So he had a pelvic tilt as well as quadriceps compensation in order to get clearance. And I and I. I want to emphasize the fact that when you normalize these feet with an AFO to the extent that you can, uh, and, and he was very effectively treated with, with the AFO that Doug was showing, not only did his, comp, his quadriceps compensation pretty much completely disappear, but when his leg went into swing phase, the pelvic was leveled to the ground, the pelvis was leveled to the ground. So you're, you are, while you're, you're basically capturing the ankle joint at different phases of gait with an AFO. You are affecting both the knee joint and the hip joint uh, uh, during the entire gait cycle. And that particular case, uh, they all showed it, but that one showed it dramatically. Uh, and uh, I, I thought maybe you were gonna talk about that a little bit, but um, maybe on the next lecture you will. Yeah, so what you're, what, what you're saying very astutely and then what you observed is he, he learned how to shorten his affected leg for ground clearance. Correct. And what we see in the older patients is when we uh, address it with the AFO, they've learned this compensated gait pattern that they still shorten and they still, I think what Mark was alluding to, that fellow very effectively decompensated and walked normally. But you'll have some patients that have learned this excessive firing of their quad, their hip flexor, and even their uh, pelvic alignment, so that now they still have this acquired limb length discrepancy. So really good point. I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, these are great points uh, for all the viewers, especially because even if you're going to do a reconstructive surgery and um, you know each surgery has its limitations, what you can and cannot do, but it's important that you evaluate the gait before uh, before the surgery of the patient and really pay attention to what is happening and how the patient's compensating because once you understand the limitations of your surgery, 
then effectively you can treat and help the patient postoperatively either with custom orthotics or some kind of bracing or some kind of a conservative measure and don't feel you have to do everything on the table because sometimes you just can't do it. Um, and it's a good point. Um, we have another question. Um, what uh, The question says, what about a Charcot Marie II patient um, that has progressed from the dynamic assist when they had some muscle strength but now has flaccid drop foot? Do you progress to a more rigid device as the muscles continue to decrease in function? And let's say if the knee is stable and or unstable. I want to know what your thoughts were. So basically the muscle uh, is deteriorating and as the muscle deteriorates, obviously affects the gait. How do you change your prescription for the devices as that is happening functionally? Yeah, the, uh, that's a great question. And, th and that is the problem is that the nurse that I showed was just an ideal candidate because she hadn't, uh, I, I'm not sure how or why, but she never developed significant contracture of her calf musculature, uh, creating a, a, a functional equinus. Uh, but they do generally do that. And when you get these older patients who have had CMT since adolescence, they're already in fixed equinus, and that dynamic assist brace isn't going to work. And so you have to put them in some type of more rigid, uh, solid AFO, sometimes uh, with a posterior stop, sometimes just an overall solid AFO um, to help prevent that plantar contracture. Uh, and you would put a heel lift on. Uh, you would try to get the tibia to perpendicular with a heel lift. But your real challenge there is this frontal plane, the cavus deformity. You know. You've got this muscle imbalance that's pulling the forefoot into inversion uh, or in, into adduction. You've got this gradual acquired varus alignment of the hind foot. And the typical solid AFOs don't, uh, generally, the foot plates aren't designed, or, and they could be, but they're generally not designed to try to uh, correct that frontal plane imbalance, which is really, in many cases, creating a bigger problem for the patient than the drop foot. So I think that was a good point. I'll just say not all CMT patients are created the same. And Mark? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, one of the most frustrating things with CMT patients is not so much the, the progressive, at least in my experience, uh, is not, not so much the progressive weakness of the, of the, of the musculature, but even though, it's, even though it's, uh, uh, there's perineal muscular atrophy, uh, that's, that's very variable, uh, depending upon what the presentation is. And when you've got a progressive hind foot supinatus, then what often happens in these cases is you get, you get dynamic imbalance and the intrinsics pull the medial column down. So that the kind of foot plates that you have that are these neutral extended foot plates that go out from beyond the arch are not tolerable by the patient. Because they've got this rid, this planet, this dynamic deformity, which becomes progressively more rigid as the medial column drops from intrinsic muscle imbalance from the external, uh, from the perineals to the intrinsics, pulling the medial column down. And so uh, uh, that's why a custom footbed, uh, along the lines that we as podiatrists look like, look at as custom footbeds, is much more appropriate in those kind of cases. Agreed. Um, this is uh, there's a question. Another question. We've had actually a lot of questions. Um, this uh, participant wants to know: Suppose a patient had a fixed deformity, and they haven't specified where. So I'm assuming maybe subtalar joint, metatarsal joint. Um, is there? Would you consider using a hinged or a motion type of AFO to help relieve pain and propulse, or would you consider? using an AFO that splints the area, doesn't really cause any degree of motion, which intent, unintentionally would cause pain? Well, I think I understand the question. Generally, you know, with foot orthoses and, and also with our devices, we generally, unless told otherwise, we try to correct the deformity intrinsically with balancing of the cast. You know, for example, if there's a big forefoot uh, valgus, plantar flex first ray, 
a inverted rear foot, we will balance the forefoot to the rear foot to try to uh, bring that hind foot back out of supination compensation to a more perpendicular attitude. If the patient's subtalar joint is already arthritic and ankylosed from trauma or old age, whatever, we already know that we can't correct that. And so we encourage practitioners to tell us when joints are fused or deformity is non-reducible because we don't want to try to correct it with a cast correction. That's going to create a problem. Having said that, bracing that deformity and controlling two to three millimeters of, of uh, subluxation beyond that deformity often results in significant reduction of symptoms. And so that, that older gentleman with a stage four adult acquired flat foot, we didn't really achieve a big correction there and we knew we couldn't because his rear foot was ankylosed. But we cast it and braced around the deformity. We applied a few posts and wedges and lo and behold, we relieved his pain. So I think the question from the practitioner was, yeah, you, you can hinge and articulate devices. The real question is, do you want the lab to correct alignment? Do you want to try to bring them to an ideal alignment? And in many cases, you can't do it and shouldn't do it. So are uh, you essentially saying that you post your deformity and make it perpendicular to the ground and just hold it there and make it comfortable for the patient to just ambulate and carry on? In many cases, yes. Of course, we always defer to the practitioner, but you know we need that kind of input. Yeah. Mark, any comments on that? Uh, not, not on that. No, not, not additionally on that. I agree with what was said. Okay. Um, another question I is. I have a comment on something else, but let's get the questions from the audience. Okay. Another question is, um, you know, one of the lectures that we did uh, was a habitual, where well, we included a habitual toe walker. And now we know that they're going to reduce over time, but let's say now you have a kid that is beyond 10 years old and it hasn't reduced. And um, now, now you're seeing the more drastic changes uh, with the superstructures. Is there one thing that you would recommend to use uh, in terms of a device that would help the most uh, with kids that are on their toes, walking on their toes? Well, I'll tell you, at least anecdotally, my friends, the idiopathic toe walker, you know, the child who has adequate ankle joint dorsiflexion on exam, but toe walks for reasons we still don't fully understand. I had great, great uh, success using a fixed position Ritchie brace at 90 degrees, and they immediately walked with a heel strike as long as they wore the brace. I found that these uh, idiopathic toe walkers were not real compliant about wearing their brace. That was the challenge. But um, now the, pay, the, the, the toe walker who has true contracture, um, I, I don't know that, that the, brace by its, the, the brace by itself isn't necessarily gonna uh, solve that. It could be an adjunct to other rehabilitative measures and certainly post-surgical uh, uh, remedies to improve ankle joint dorsiflexion help maintain the correction. But I was very enthusiastic about the use of AFO bracing for the idiopathic toe walker. Yes. Would you uh, would you use a hinged apparatus? I think that's what the practitioner wants to know. And let's say the patient's going through physical therapy and you're gradually increasing the dorsiflexion. Would you hold the dorsiflexion depending on where it is uh, and try to kind of stretch it functionally while using the brace with the hinge? No, uh, I would not use a hinge brace. I would fix them at their maximal end range of dorsiflexion. Because if you if you hinge them, they're just going to go more into plantar flexion freely. Mark, any questions or comments? No, that that's it. Uh, you you are specifying a patient uh, a habitual toe walker with secondary adaptative contracture of the gastroxoleus. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with Doug. You're better with a fixed hinge. Okay. Uh, another uh, participant would like to know um, what kind of AFO do you recommend for a diabetic patient that has a first ray amputation with recurrent ulcers on the medial arch on the left, let's say on the left foot? First ray amputation. With all the recurring ulcers on the medial side. So he's definitely pronating. Um, 
uh, and hind foot and possibly the tarsal joint. Well, you might be able to control that. You, you don't necessarily need an AFO to control that unless there's sagittal plane problems with uh, Aquinas, contracture, other things. Now, if he's had a ray amputation, I don't know where his tip, how his anterior tib is functioning, if at all, and, and whether he's getting a drop foot due to that. But I generally, I really like the combination of a carbon fiber AFO with a total contact diabetic type orthotic overlay on top of the carbon graphite foot plate. Mm -hmm. Would a custom orthotic work in this instance? Let's assume that it's not completely rigid, but um, you know it's mimicking a flat foot um, and it was, a, it was a partial first ray, so tibial's anterior is still uh, active. Um, would you, can you consider putting a uh, medial, uh, a medial sky sure. and probably post it? You know? Absolutely, absolutely. As long as you have a compliant patient, yes. Yeah. Mark, any um, comments on that? Well, yeah, it, uh, it, it's it's basically restating what what I one of the first comments that I made is the problem in a foot line, in, in that kind of a foot type is you've got nothing you you, you now don't have a, a fully intact medial column to limit the internal rotation of the tibia when they get into mid stance. And so uh, the advantage of going above the ankle with an orthosis in that case is to limit excessive internal rotation of the tibia. And in so doing, you are, you are also in that way offloading to an extent the pressure on the medial, medial side of the foot. And so that's why that's, that's what the orthotic, the foot orthotic by itself cannot do. And so if you don't have retrograde force from the medial column to keep the, to keep the mid arch up, you can help that by using an AFO, uh, which is one of the first things Doug, he didn't talk about medial uh, or ray amputation patients, but it has to do with abrogating the moment of force on the foot. And you can do that more effectively with an AFO. Well, I think that was the last of our question. Uh, it's been a great, uh, it's been a great lecture and a discussion, and and the pathology uh, reviewed you know, was extensive. Um, just for the viewers to know, we start a series of our, our ankle series uh, starting in September, and we have a great lectures and topics uh, for you. And uh, we will definitely make sure we find a way of having Dr. Ritchie back with us again, with the extensive knowledge that he has to contribute. Um, I thank everyone, Dr. Ritchie, it's always a pleasure. Dr. Bernard, thank you again. And uh, we hope to uh, see you all again soon. Thank you very much. Thank Bye you. Everyone.